Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 12th chapter. The more I reflect upon the sermon title, except for the first three words, the more boring I think it sounds. Now, the first three words of the sermon title are okay. It says, I am going. Perhaps you've heard those three words at some point here at Southeastern. I am going. Those are the exciting parts. But then the second line of the sermon, if there were a second line of the title, would be to be a church member. To be a church member. You hear I am going and you start thinking about the mission fields in Southeast Asia. You think about the churches that need revitalization across North America. You think about the opportunity to plant churches anywhere and everywhere. And then you hear this sermon title, I am going to be a church member. It almost evokes yawns and sense of boredom immediately. But as we dig into the text that the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, as we look at the pericope of 1 Corinthians 12, verses 21 through 27, we're going to see that perhaps it does not evoke the boredom as I described it. Perhaps there is something a bit exciting. Perhaps there is something to be commended when you say today and in the future, I am going to be a church member. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he writes this church. It was, it was a church that had many blessings, marked blessings. They knew the new life in Christ, but they were having trouble letting go of the old order. They really wanted to hang on to the worldliness that was around them in many ways, while at the same time grasping Christ and the salvation which was free to them. And so it became a church of many problems, morality issues, doctrinal issues. The list would go on and on. The purpose of this message is not to go through the problems of Corinth, but simply to say in many ways that this was a church that's not unlike many of the churches that we know today. Let's pick up in verse 12 as Paul begins to use a metaphor, an analogy, if you will, of what the church is like. In verse 12, he says, For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves and free, so we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, with that foundation, allow me then to skip some of the, par- the verses and go to the essence of the sermon beginning in verse 21. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. But even more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary, and those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe these with great honor, and our unpresentable parts have a better presentation. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together, giving great honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Local churches are weird. They're different. They have problems. Any of you and all of you know the reality of walking into a local church thinking that perhaps it was going to be the the, the new order of Christian life and joy and continuous no problems day by day. And then you're at the local church for a day or two or three. And you begin to discover it's made up of sinners just like you and me. And you begin to think, okay, is this what the local church is about? Why why would God give us this manifestation? Why would he give us what he calls the body of Christ with his imperfections? We know that the universal church will never die, but local congregations, local expressions of this will have their struggles. 
Now keep in mind that this is what God left us. This is what Christ left us. This is what he said would be his witness. Whether we are going to Southeast Asia or Southeast Alabama, he said the local church will be the manifestation which you will serve. Now certainly there will be places outside the church, certainly there will be opportunities beyond the context of the local body, but you have been given this local congregation to make a difference. I love the local church with all of its problems, with all of its challenges, with all of its crazy business meetings, with all of the wackiness that sometimes takes place. I love the local church. I've been a part of a local church in one way or another for virtually the entirety of my life. Though I was unchurched as a teenager, from the point I got married forward, I have been closely tied to the local church. And then in vocational ministry, I've served as a pastor of four churches, as an interim pastor of nine churches, researched over 50,000 churches, and hear from about two-thirds of Protestant churches across the United States every year through the blog, TomRainer.com, and I get to hear what God is doing. And sometimes it's not very pretty. My first church, for example, first church, Southern Indiana, preached in view of a call. We used to call it trial sermon. You know why it's called a trial sermon? Because you go on trial and if they vote you guilty, you become the pastor. <laughs> vote in view of a call. I preached there literally week after week and every time I would be told I was not good enough. And finally, on a particular day, I was met by the search committee. His name was Merle. And, and, and Merle said, I think we're going to vote on you as pastor. I said, why, did I preach a sermon that was good enough? He said, no. He said, you still stink, but it's Palm Sunday and we need a preacher for Easter, so we're gonna vote on you. <laughs> what I'm about to tell you is a true story. This is not an exaggeration. I'm no longer a pastor. I have no need to exaggerate. It is absolutely true. This is the vote to call me was six to one. There were seven people in this church and I could not get a unanimous vote. Mary Mulliken voted against me. It's funny that I still remember her name. She was also the first one of the seven to die. I'm not trying to make a correlation, I'm just pointing that out. And it was from that point where I began to serve as a pastor to this day at Lifeway that with all of its laws, with all of its inadequacies, just like this forgiven sinner named Tom Rainer, I have learned to love the local church. Allow me to share, at least from this context, this metaphor of the body of Christ, what Paul would say we need to remember. I, I just, I read these verses again, and you know how you dive into scripture sometime and you, you just get excited all over again. God reveals new insights and, and you see things from a new perspective. That happened to me as I dug into these verses and began to prepare for this message for chapel. And it just reminded me again and again what God has done for us. But now let's ask the question. As he has so graciously given to us, what are we to do for him if we are going to be a church member? I would contend that these four, that these verses have four primary themes as the metaphor of the body of Christ is used. Let me just share those now and then we'll back up and look at each of those. First of all, there's the issue of contribution, what we're to do to contribute to the body of Christ. Secondly, there is the issue of unity Third, there's the issue of compassion. And then fourth, there is the issue of love. If we can use these four words as our takeaways from this message, we will have gotten the essence of what Paul is saying to us, whether we are serving as pastor, staff, missionary, planter, deacon, elder, church member, what we are to do as church members. Contribution unity, compassion, love. 
Let's look at this issue of contribution really spelled out in verses 21 to 23. I love the way Paul does this. He takes different parts of the physical anatomical body of Christ and he begins to use them to talk about us. And this is where we get the word members. This is where the word membership originated in the context of the New Testament church, the body of Christ. He, he divides this membership, in essence, into three different groups. The first of these is found in verse 21, where he talks about the eye, the head, and the feet. So the eye cannot say to the hand, and to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And the first thing that he does is he brings forth what we would call the external parts of the body of Christ that are visible. I head, hand, feet. And he said, this is, these are parts of the body of Christ. And they are integral to the body. But then he has a second group in verse 22, where he begins to say, but even more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. Now, now, now Paul is using language here that is the perspective of those who may be looking on the outside in. What does he mean when he says those that are weaker? In other words, those that are not visible. These first ones are visible to us, but now we have another group that is really, if you want to use this in the sense of church membership, is behind the scenes, but it is vital to the body. If Paul were to spell them out, he would spell out the heart and the liver and the lungs and the brain. He would say, you cannot see these, they're, they're, they're invisible on the surface, but think how important they are to the body of Christ. But even more of those parts of the body that seem to be, seem to be weaker are necessary. And he goes from the external to the internal to what we would probably call the private parts, the parts that are clothed in most civilizations. And he begins to speak of those in verse 23. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe those with great honor and our unpresentable parts have a better presentation. Now what is Paul doing here? He's presenting to us three different groups of members of the body. The external, the internal, the private, And in every context here, he's saying that they are all vital to the contribution of the health of the body of Christ. That there is no one, no part that the body can do without and remain healthy. He categorizes them for a reason. He understands that as we look at this, we will understand that there's some people who are out front in our churches. There's some people behind the scenes. And there's some people who just don't want to be seen at any point. And he said, all three of these are necessary for the body of Christ. They all contribute to the health. The second issue, the first one is, remember, contribution. The second issue is unity. The second issue is unity. Now, I was literally born and raised in southeast Alabama. For, for, for those of you who, who, who remember, and y'all are all too young to remember, uh, a song by Clarence Carter called Patches. And I used to, I used to sing that song. I'm not going to sing it now, but it, it started, I was born and raised in, in Alabama on a farm way back up in the woods. Well... I was born and raised in Alabama, but it wasn't on a farm, and it wasn't way back up in the woods, but it sounds good when I sing it, so sometimes I I sing it, but I was born in this small town called Union Springs, Alabama. Union Springs, Alabama, as far as amenities, has absolutely nothing. I mean, it is really, really a bad place to live and grow up. But I remember when I was young, and I'm talking about I'm 60 now, I remember when I was about eight or nine years old, and it was announced that Union Springs was going to get a country club. I didn't know what a country club was. 
Never heard of such. Now, to be certain, this was not the luxurious country club of the big city. This was mainly a place that served you food, had a swimming pool, and had a nine-hole golf course. And that was about it, a couple of tennis courts. But it was something that we had never seen before. And I remember so well the first time I went to the country club. It didn't cost much for my middle-class parents to be members. I went to the country club, and here is what I found out. I could go swimming as long as I wanted. And, and when I got hungry, there was a, a, a window from the dining room to poolside. And I had been told that we had this food allowance. And from my perspective, that meant you could get food free. And I remember going up to there and I pointed to this person. I said, I would like a cheeseburger. And she gave me one just the way I wanted and she didn't ask for any money. And I said, this is so cool. This is so cool. I went swimming some more, got hungry again. I would like another cheeseburger with fries and onion rings. She gave me all the health foods there right on the plate. It was absolutely incredible. And I found this out, ladies and gentlemen. I found out what it was like to be a member of something. I pay my dues, or in this case, my parents do, and people serve me. They give me everything I want. They meet my every whim and desire. And if I don't get my needs met, I will protest and threaten to withhold my dues. You get the point? Church membership in too many of our congregations has become country club membership. We'll pay our way, and I want the music my way. We'll pay our way, and I will want the order of business to go this way. We'll pay our way, and I want you to meet my needs. And church becomes all about me, myself, and I. But listen very carefully. For all of us who serve in the name of Jesus Christ, that is not membership at all in Scripture. Listen to what Paul would go on to say. Pick up at verse 24. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, verse 25, so that there would be no division in the body. So that there would be no division in the body. Do you get what's going on here? The members of the body of Christ are functioning. They are giving. They are serving. They're doing what God has called them to do. Obviously, these members of the body are doing so without fussing or fighting or dividing. And hear this very well, please. This truth of contribution and then unity not only applies to the greater body, what we typically call the people in the pew or the church members. It applies to those of us who've been called vocationally into servant leadership into these churches as well. What happens in the midst of ornery, cantankerous, have it my way church members, we who are leaders go into the church and say, I'm here to serve. I'm here to be last. I'm here to function. I am here because I want to be a part of the body the way God has put us into this body of Christ. And I know that there will be times that I will be hurt, and I know that there will be times that I will be criticized, and I know that there will be times that I may even be fired. But I will love the body of Christ because it's not about me. It's about the greater good of the body. I said, remember the issue of contribution, 
the issue of unity. Quickly, let's go to the issue of compassion. Picking up at the end of uh, verse 25, we'll just start at the beginning of verse 25 and go on through 26. So that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Do you hear what's going on? It's that word called compassion or caring or empathy. It is, it is that we are putting so much of our needs aside for the good of the body that we cannot help but to have compassion upon others. Think about all healthy relationships. How do healthy marriages stay healthy? It's when the husband says to the wife, I want to do everything I can to be the type of husband that God has called me to be. I want to be the leader of this household. I want to, I want to love you as Christ has loved the church. I want to do, I want to just sacrifice in order to be the kind of husband you want me to be, wife, or that God wants me to be. And the wife responds, I will submit to you gladly. And that in that I will find joy because I'm putting myself last. And each of these in this relationship are saying, you're first, I'm last. Think about friendships. The best friendships are where people are always trying to do for one another. So those relationships have power and meaning in the body of Christ too. It means that we will have concern for others, compassion for others. And when there's suffering within the body, we suffer with it. And when there's joy, we congratulate. There is no competition within the church or between churches. There is joy when something good happens in the body of Christ. There is compassion for those who are hurting and who are needy. You see, the Corinthian church really had all it needed. Spiritual gifts were present. Just go back to 1, 7, chapter 1, verse 7 to read some of that. The right doctrine was there for the most part. Obviously, they had some aberration. But look at chapter 11, verse 2. And you can see that there was right doctrine. But this fourth thing was what the greatest need was in the church at Corinth. Certainly they needed to contribute. Certainly they needed to be unified. Certainly they needed to demonstrate compassion. But the fourth issue was the issue of love. Look how 1 Corinthians 12 ends. Now you are the body of Christ, verse 27, and individual members of it. There's that church membership metaphor once again. And then we can look at all the different giftedness that concludes verse 12, but then look at the transition verse to verse 13, which is verse 31. But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. I'll show you the better way transitioning right into the magnificent love chapter. The love chapter is first and foremost in its context about the body of Christ. It's about the church at Corinth, and it's about our church. And so when Paul begins that eloquent chapter that has been read at weddings and other places where love has been demonstrated, If I speak human or angelic languages but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In verse 3, if I donate all my goods to feed the poor and if I give my body in order to boast but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's not boastful. It's not conceited. does not act improperly. is not selfish. is not provoked and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It is easier to be orthodox than to be loving. It is easier to be active in a church than to be loving in the church. Above all, Christ said, if we're really going to be a part of the body of Christ, if we're going to be contributing, unified, compassionate, it all 
must be surrounded, immersed, and captivated by love. Served, in, I'm not going to even talk about the nine churches as I wrap this up. I'm not going to ch- talk about the nine churches where I served as interim pastor because that's a piece of cake. It's like being a grandparent. You know, a deacon or an elder messes up and you just give them back and you leave. It's not a big deal. But serving as pastor, because I'm a thin skinned type of guy, serving as pastor was not always easy for me. And to hear some of the critics and to get some of the barbs that were thrown my way was often extremely painful. And there was one time when one particular person was just on me. He had accused me of doing some things I did not do. He had made some statements in a business meeting. You know the story. Almost every pastor or even staff have gone through this. And all I could think of was to go to Scripture and read imprecatory psalms about him. But That wasn't what God wanted me to do. And I was praying actually in my study on whether I should leave the church or stay because I was so beaten up. And I'm not going to suggest for one moment that I heard an audible voice or even could tell you with clarity exactly what was taking place, but I sensed that single word, love. Love. And I don't know why in the moment when I was just praying out of anger and praying out of escape, that word came to me. Or God brought that word to me. Love. I didn't particularly like it at the time because it was in the context of my complaining about that guy, about that church member about that fellow who had made my life totally miserable. Love him. Love him. And it hit at that moment. Who are you, Tom Rainer? Who are you that have sent Jesus to the cross with your sin? Who are you to act uppity And to think you're any better than even that biggest troublemaker. Who are you? And as Christ loved me, I cannot say I loved him with equal measure. But I prayed a different prayer. Lord, I cannot love him in my own strength. Help me to love him in yours. Did everything get okay immediately? Nope. He's still a jerk. But he was a jerk now that was kind of a jerk like me. He'd been given God's grace, and so had I. He had known forgiveness, and so had I. And it gave me a brand new perspective. Yeah, y'all are headed to excited places if you're not already there. All over the globe all over North America, planting churches, revitalizing churches, risking your life for the sake of the gospel. But everywhere you go, there will be a church. Some of them may be traditional and with tall steeples. Some of them may be underground in a house. But there will be a church. Remember, I am going to be a church member as God has called me to be a church member. And in doing so, I will demonstrate those characteristics of contribution, unity, compassion, and love. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Pray with me.
I am going, Father, to be a church member. I am going, Father, to sacrifice, to show compassion, to show love, to contribute. I am going, Father. And as I go, so you go with me. Lord, thank you for the body of Christ manifest in local congregations all across the world. Thank you that you have put me, an imperfect one, in the midst of an imperfect group. Together, we are members of the body of Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.